Chao himself. Then uh, Grand Chief Edward John, who also has had a Chao himself. Then uh, Grand Chief Edward John, who also has had a tremendous career, uh, will tell us his story. He's been involved in our provincial government and been involved in many important issues, including the creation of our treaty commission. We will hear from Elizabeth Hunt, a practicing lawyer in the Caribou, who practices Aboriginal law and has managed to do that, along with being a full-time mother of two. We deeply regret we are unable to have uh, Mary Ellen Turpel Lafond with us today. She's the province's representative for children and youth, but unfortunately a personal matter has come up and she cannot be with us uh, today. Uh, but we also want to have an opportunity to hear from you, uh, participants, during the question, uh, question period. We really value your interest in this. Uh, we have some uh, very important other guests in the crowd who uh, I think may even ask some questions, but certainly will respond to them. Our Chief Justice of the Court of Appeal, Chief Justice Finch, is here. Chief Justice uh, Bauman of our Supreme Court and Chief Judge Crabtree of our Provincial Court are here and, and we welcome them. I think their attendance indicates the importance that the legal community places on the integration of Aboriginal students into the legal profession. As you may be aware, the benchers, which is some old import, I think Captain Vancouver brought this term with him, uh, which we call the Board of Directors of the Law Society, have identified retaining Aboriginal lawyers in the legal profession as one of the key objectives in our current strategic plan. This is something that our membership is fully supportive of. In support of this uh, objective, the Law Society has undertaken several initiatives, and this is one and, and probably the most public of those initiatives. We want to hear from you, First Nations lawyers and leaders in the bar. We have come a long way in this province. In 1919, the benchers of the Law Society passed a resolution that prevented First Nations and other specific ethnic minorities from being admitted into the legal profession. That was 1919. It was not until 1949 that First Nations people were even eligible to be called to the bar. As we will hear more about soon, it was a young law student, Alfred Scow, who made history as the first Aboriginal lawyer in BC. He subsequently went on to sit on our provincial court. While we have come a long way, there is certainly much more work to be done. At the, at the Law Society, we are presently undertaking a demogra uh, demographic project to better understand the participation of Aboriginal lawyers. We and the Law Society, or, and the law schools simply had no idea of the numbers presently in the profession. We are going, as we did with women in the legal profession, we are going to develop a business case for diversity, including the retention and advancement of Aboriginal lawyers. It is my hope that you will enjoy today's discussion that we will illuminate the valuable role you play in helping us enhance diversity in the BC Bar. It is our feeling that the profession is stronger and the public is best served when the Bar reflects the the communities that it represents. I hope that a, min a minimum of you will leave here today with an inspiring stories connecting future leadership. I do, before I close my remarks, want to make a few personal comments about Alfred Scout. Um, in, in addition to being the first Aboriginal lawyer, and we've heard from Elder Grant about his journey through law school, Alfred Scout was also a member of the provincial court and in his early and I, I believe first assignments, he was given a very difficult task, and that was being the, one of the provincial court judges that serviced eastern Vancouver Island. This happened in, uh, in the um, late 60s, early 70s, and the particular problem identified at that time was my being called to the bar in the early 1970s and practicing in Vancouver Island, so they needed a special judge to handle the lawyers on, uh, on eastern Vancouver Island. 
So I actually had an opportunity of appearing before Judge Scow, and he was a terrific person, very, very, uh, very, very understanding of young lawyers. And I, I can certainly say all the people in that part of the world appreciated him as a judge. Playing golf with Alfred Scow was a totally different story. <laughs> when I spoke to him early on, I said to him he was a great judge, but I have to tell you folks, I think Alfred Scow was probably the worst golfer in the world. <laughs> and with those very, very positive remarks, I'll now hand the uh, rest of the day's events over to Duncan McHugh. Duncan, thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. Um, the next part of our program is to honor a, a, a very respected member of the Aboriginal community, of the legal community, a respected member of British Columbia and Canada, for that matter. Um, and there will be much said about Alfred Scow's, uh, Judge Alfred Scow's career. I just do want it to note one thing personally. Um, Joan and, and Alfred, Judge Scow, are simply tireless in their efforts at supporting so many community events. And that's how I've gotten to know them over the years, is they are simply always there uh, for law students, for uh, legal practitioners, um, for members of the First Nations. When they are asked to come and to present their wisdom or, or uh, to, to be at events, um, they're there, and, and it's just remarkable to see and, and really quite an inspiration. But you'll hear a lot about Judge Scow's career and, and his accomplishments from our next speaker, uh, Tina Dion. I have an unusual, uh, being an MC today, I know many uh, of the people that I'm going to be introducing, so you can read their bio. They are all uh, have a number of remarkable achievements, uh, but I'll just make a few personal uh, observations. Tina was a year behind me uh, in law school. And if, if I could think of one word to describe Tina, as I saw her striding purposefully down the, the law school hallways, uh, it was focus. Um, you knew, uh, I knew right away, anybody knew when they saw Tina Dion that this was a woman who uh, was going places and had a goal in mind. Um, and she has indeed achieved many things in her remarkable career thus far. Many more to come, I'm sure. Uh, the one thing you won't see in her bio uh, is that she is an incredible mother as well, um, raising a, a son uh, through law school and through her legal career as well. Um, but she's also um, played a huge role in the SCOW Institute, and so I um, welcome Tina Dion to, to talk about Judge SCOW. Thank you very much for those comments, Duncan. I, um, what I was asked to do here today, and I hope you can see me uh, up around these items here at the table, um, I was asked to attend and participate here today in order to speak about Judge Scow. And um, I've, 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 I've known Judge Scow for many years now, and I'll get into it a little bit more in my presentation, and I want to um, just apologize beforehand. I, I'm very fond of Joan and Alfred, and if at the close of my remarks I get a bit tearful, you'll have to excuse me. Um, I, I think it's okay because I'm not in court. So um, I'm going to just uh, open with those remarks and um, acknowledge uh, Mr. President, the dignitaries in the room, uh, ladies and gentlemen, students and guests. Um, I'd like to um, just say that with respect to um, Alfred Scow, we'll all agree that he is a remarkable man, and I'm, it's, can someone help me move this? Is sort of in the way, and I'd hate to knock it over. Um, when we think of Judge Scow, we think of his lovely wife of 46 years, Joan. Can we pull it back just a bit? Who is sitting here with him today? I'll speak more about Joan in my presentation. Together with my comments are a series of photos that the Scows kindly agreed to share with you today. 
I think they add real personality to this presentation. Here, um, shown here is Alfred with his grandfather and his father, Chief John Scow to his right, his grandfather and his father, Chief William David Scow to his left. In this photo, Alfred is about the age of six years old, and the photo is somewhat deceiving in that I'm told by Alfred that he's actually, actually photoshopped in to um, this photo of his father and grandfather, but I'm assured that uh, his age at the time that this photo was taken is um, at par. So um, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't leave any, um, needed to acknowledge that. But um, what it does do is it depicts him at the age of six years old when, uh, with his father and grandfather, um, and this photo was taken at Wadham's Cannery at Rivers Inlet in about 1932. Alfred, born April 10, 1927 in Alert Bay, was the eldest of 16 children born to his parents, William and Alice Neewanek Scow. Here, in this photo, by the age of 15, Alfred, here with his father, owned his own boat, fished for salmon, and contributed to the fi family finances. His father, William, a self-educated engineer and later a provincial court magistrate, and his mother were strong supporters of formal education. Alfred attended St. Michael's Indian Residential School from 1936 to 1941 and then public schools in Richmond and in Vancouver. In his senior year, Alfred was asked what he intended to do after high school. He announced to the editors of the Kitsilano High School Yearbook for the first time of his intention to become a lawyer. Alfred, fishing over time, financed three years of arts and his law degree. In 1948, when Alfred was a student at UBC, his father, Chief William Scow, along with artist Ellen Neal, approached the UBC Alumni Association about presenting UBC with a totem pole from their village, which represented the Thunderbird symbol. The totem was dedicated at halftime of a homecoming football game. The commissioner of the Department of Indian Affairs also attended that dedication. Alfred, as Alfred explained it to me, he attended this presentation and in fact was part of the presenting committee in that he wore a cultural mask out onto the field. Alfred told me that before going out onto the field, however, he told his father, I'm very nervous, to which his father replied, why be nervous? No one will know it's you. <laughs> there are a number of reasons that Alfred's father donated the Thunderbird symbol to UBC, but the primary one was it was meant to be a gesture to UBC to encourage the institution to welcome Aboriginal students to higher education. And I, I pause for a moment just to acknowledge that the UBC Thunderbird symbol, um, when I'm asked to speak about uh, Alfred at various events, I make a note of making a point of the symbol because I believe it, it, it shows and it goes back to um, Alfred's um, calling in life, which has been to bridge gaps between the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal community. Alfred was 